And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day that you've given us, for allowing us to come together to worship you and study your word. I just ask that you'd bless Pastor Charles and give him words to speak and allow us to open our hearts and hear your word and to be a blessing and a witness to others as we go out today. In your name, Lord Jesus, I pray. Amen. We just ask that you would continue to pray right where you're at, just quietly, uh, that God would send, the Father would send the Spirit to attend to our time for the preaching and the teaching of his word. So would you just quietly, at where you're at, pray that for us all, especially for me. Dear Heavenly Father, may that be an affectionate call for us this morning as we address you as our Father and as we address you as Almighty God, maker of heaven and earth, for you are our Lord and our God. And what it is, Lord, that we can call you our Father, what a thing to fathom this morning. As we look at these little children, Lord, that Jesus welcomed into his arms, that he caressed and blessed. Father, may we understand that, that salvation, Lord, that comes through the gospel to us, Lord, through faith in Christ alone. So we ask, Father, this morning that you would do so, Lord. You keep us mindful of the greatness of the gospel, mindful of who we are in Christ. And, Father, that you would be exalted, that Christ would be exalted for your glory and that you would attend to our time with your spirit, Lord. We do beg that, Father. We ask for your forgiveness, Father. Forgive our sins. Lord, as you have taken us out of the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of your beloved Son, through that which we have in the redemption, Lord, the forgiveness of our sins. We are thankful this morning, Father. Please pardon our sins, set them aside. Set away the things that, that uh, distract us this morning, Father, that we come to you with a clear conscience, prepared to hear your word preached. So I ask, Father, for myself, Lord, that you would do so. You would impart to me your spirit that I might be a faithful servant of Christ and a steward of your mysteries, in that being found faithful by your power, by your spirit. So we ask, please, for your blessing upon the time. May you be glorified, and Father, may it be for the good of your people. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the vital questions that John MacArthur asks of this text, does this answer the question of where children go before they can make a profession of faith? What about children who die in the womb? What about children who die at birth? What happens to them? Does this negate uh, the Lamb's book of life? Does this negate predestination? No, no, but this is a difficult hermeneutics question. Uh, Dr. Mike Canham, you've met, doc, some of you met one of my mentors, Dr. Mike Canham. He was my hermeneutics teacher, and he, in the first, very first year, he taught us many things, and he also challenged us in many ways. He didn't, didn't let us sit um, and develop a prideful nature. He said he would stop us at all, all, all aspects in that. But hermeneutics is the science and skill of biblical interpretation. So this morning, I'm going to have to talk to you a little bit about hermeneutics. Everybody okay with that? Everybody ready for a little Sunday school class? So everybody's like, whatever. <laughs> Sunday, I want to go for the hike. But we just need to understand some of the words that are used here and some of the highlights of this. Many just pass over this section in these four verses and just say, this is just an introduction and a contrast to the rich young ruler, which is true. It is a contrast between the rich young ruler and these little children. There's a big contrast here, right? So we don't want to negate that, but we also don't want to just skip over these four verses and say, oh, there's not much here. No, there's things that are huge here. And one of the huge things is as we cross-reference the fact that it's also recorded in Matthew and in Luke, the terminology that each of those uses to highlight what's going on in this very scene. Are these children, the ones he's embracing, these little infants, are they headed for heaven? Is that group of little ones headed for heaven? Let's ask that question this morning and let's see how the text of Scripture answers that question for us this morning. So, in the part of heaven, 
And this would run contrary. It's a time we have to first look at the contrast that is here before us, that there's a huge contrast between the two things that we're looking at this morning. So we're going to be looking at the setting of this, this, this text. We're going to be looking at the severity in the text, the rebuke and the anger that Jesus has for his disciples, then the sensitivity and the salvation. So we're going to look at the setting first. We're going to look at what is the setting around this? What does the culture have at the time? How do we view little kids right now? Anybody a politician in the room? What do politicians love to do? They love to take babies and kiss them, right? Let's not do that now that we have COVID, right? Let's just not ever, ever do that. But what do they do? They try to promote themselves by holding a little baby and kissing it, right? Oh, look, he's a good politician. He's holding the baby, right? And I don't know how many adults are in the room, but in my life, my life kind of revolved around my kids, right? Well, the kids got this. The kids got soccer. The kids have this. They have Boy Scouts. We got to do everything around them. And it revolves around them, right? Life kind of revolves around our kids, right? as they're growing up. And then when they get older, it was like, I'm breaking your dinner plate on the corner of the table. You're out of here, right? Any other fathers do that? I do that. My daughter, though, she's smiling up there because she's 16 here real soon. I don't know that I'll be able to do that with my daughter. She can stay home until she's 59 or something like that. Um, That's just my plan. I mean, who knows what will happen. But the world revolves around our kids nowadays. Back then, it wasn't so. Huge contrast. Back then, no, not the same, okay? When Jesus does this, he's flipping things over. He's t- completely contrasting what the Pharisees would be teaching, that there's no value to the kids until they reach a certain age, until they come, come of age. And so that's a huge, huge thing for us. But what Jesus brings to light here is their value. Jesus brings their value to light. And in doing so, he's gonna basically make salvation one of the key, key points here. The salvation of such children is a powerful an illustration of the biblical truth that salvation is by what? Grace alone. As he embraces these little ones, there's nothing they can do. We need to understand that too, because in one way, we are like these little ones. We can't do anything to save ourselves. It's only by God's grace, amen? Only by God's grace, and we celebrate that. Why do we celebrate that? Because that gives him glory. The more we realize that, the more we realize it's only by God's grace alone, who gets the credit? He does. He receives the glory for that. So as we say that, as we communicate that to other people, as we say it's only by grace alone, he's getting the glory. He's getting the honor, the praise for all of that. So that's what we need to focus on. But in this, again, in this situation, there's a huge contrast between value then and value now, and a contrast between this man that will come up later, the rich young ruler, who is extremely wealthy, fastidiously self-righteous, deeply religious. He's probably a leader from the synagogue, but he remained outside of the kingdom. He gets to the end of what Jesus says to him. And Jesus says to him what? Sell it all and give it to the poor and follow after me. What does he do? He can't do it. He simply can't do it. But here's these little ones. And he says these little ones are going to inherit the kingdom of God. What a contrast. Here's a man who sees the truth, who knows the truth, who follows after everything, yet he can't enter into the kingdom of God. Why? for the love of money, for the love of things. He possessed much things. But here's these little babies in his arms. And he's like, they're going to inherit the kingdom of God. Don't you want to be like the little baby? He's holding them. He's, he's cuddling them. He's drawing them in. He's saying, these will inherit the kingdom of God. I want to be in that position. I want to be in that position. But I have to mention something that's out there in the, uh, the realm of the culture today, and we need to address this this morning. And so I want to share with you some things that I heard two weeks ago and just say, how could anybody who claims to be a Christian believe such a thing? So hold on to your shoes here for a second. There's a, there's a man out there on MSNBC named Joe Scarborough. And have you heard about what Joe Scarborough has said in the last two weeks about the Bible and about Jesus? And in particular, this text would be a text that would come to light, as far as I'm concerned, to refute him. So this most uh, quintessential example comes from MSNBC host John Scarborough, and I'm reading from a uh, a document here from uh, Al Mohler, The Briefing. I don't know how many of you know of Al Mohler's and his podcast, The Briefing, but he caught wind of this, and of course, this is something you just cannot sit there and let go. You've got to address this, and he does. And so this is from uh, Thursday, September 15th. He addressed this very thing. So Joe Joe Scarborough spoke of the fact that he was, on his own definition, a Baptist. Ooh, okay, that's good, right? We're all Baptists, right? Everybody's a backslidden Baptist. Any backslidden Baptists in the room this morning? I think you're either a Christian or you're not a Christian. There's no such thing as being backslidden. 
This will come to light when you hear what he says. He says, however, but I still know the Bible. Okay, so Joe says he's a backslider, but he still knows the Bible. Okay, quote, that's a quote from what he very said, but I still know the Bible. Now, I just want to say, this is Al Moy says, I just want to say, when I hear someone say that, I brace myself for what's going to follow. Me too. In this case, you better brace yourself pretty securely because Joe Scarborough went on to say, quote, Jesus never once talked about abortion, never once, and it was happening back in ancient times. It was happening during his time. Never once did he mention it. So basically he's saying from argument from silence, Jesus never mentioned abortion, yet it was predominantly going on in his time. Therefore, if Jesus doesn't mention it, neither should Christians. Would you agree with Joe Scarborough? Thank you. I'm glad his people were vocal about that, right? The man says he's a Christian. The man says he's a Baptist, right? He doesn't actually say he's a Christian. He says, I'm a backslidden Baptist. So I would say, are you truly knowing, do you truly know the words of Jesus? The word which became flesh and dwelt among us. One of the things he mentions here is he says, go read the red letters. If you just go read the red letters, you'll see that Jesus never mentions abortion. I would agree. He never does because he doesn't have to. Just read Exodus 21, verses 22 through 25, where it mentions as if a woman is pregnant and you in any way hurt her and she miscarries, you're guilty of what? Murder. Man was prosecuted for that. He stabbed his wife. She was pregnant. Two counts of murder. We understand this. So what's the difference between abortion and what, he, and what the world is promoting in, in abortion and in the, in the choice of women? He went on to talk about those in particular, Republicans in particular, pro-lifers, and those of his own words, quote, people who are perverting the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is his quote. This is your exact words. People who are perverting the gospel of Jesus Christ down to one issue. He said, it's heresy. No. No, 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 no. Exact opposite, Joe. You're the heretic. We're holding to the truth. We're faithful to the truth. The truth of life. Jesus is life. He's the word which became flesh and dwelt among us. You can't limit him just to the red letters. On the road to Emmaus, he said, all the Old Testament refers to me. Therefore, when, when Psalms 51.5 is written, and what does David say? He says, from conception, I was in sin. From conception, life began at conception. Psalm 51, verse 5. And then he dared the people. He said, so he put the challenge out, quote, if you don't believe me, if, you, if this makes you angry, anybody angry yet? I was angry when I heard this. Anybody angry? Why don't you just do something that you haven't done in a long time? Open the Bible, open the New Testament, read the red letters. You won't see it, meaning abortion. Quote, there. Now, from time to time, as I say, this is Al Moore quoting, this is Al Moore response. From time to time, as I say, you come across something like this, and I describe it as a quintessential nonsense, which it is to say this is the kind of nonsense that actually represents something that of an achievement. This is a trophy of worthy of nonsense. If nonsense were an Olympic sport, Joe Scarborough just won the gold medal. That's Al Moore, not me. How could someone who says they're a Christian spout this on TV to millions and millions of people? So what I'd like to present this morning is a few things just from the word of God to say, Joe, you're so far off the beaten path, I question whether you have a knowledge of the saving faith of Jesus Christ. I can say that from what those com- the rest of what he said in this. I believe I'm standing on pretty solid ground to say, I don't believe that you know the gospel of Jesus Christ. And here's a text that we're going to take apart and we're going to do some work into the Old Testament to bring light to this and to bring setting to this. So they were bringing to him, look at verse 13, they were bringing to him. So the first thing we want to look at is the setting. Before we look at the severity and the sensitivity and salvation, we want to look at the setting. And they were bringing children to him so that he might touch them, so that he might convey a blessing to them. This is the very same thing we see in Genesis with Noah and Isaac and Jacob. They were brought to the patriarch and the patriarch would put his hands on them and would bless them, giving them an inheritance of things in the future. So these children were coming to him. So Jesus understood that the children were sinners though as well. And he used a story about this in Matthew 11. And in Matthew 11, he looks at this. Turn with me to Matthew 11. I want to just take a look at some things that Jesus would have used to illustrate that he knew the condition of children. How many of you had children that are born sinners? Yeah, they're born sinners. 
they come out being selfish. We all do. But look with me at Matthew chapter 11, verses 16 through 19. Jesus used this as an illustration to basically refute some of the teaching of the Pharisees about him, about himself, and about John the Baptist. Read with me in verse 16 of Matthew 11. But to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in a marketplace who call out to the other children and say, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. For John came, John the Baptist came, neither eating nor drinking, and yet, and they say, he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, behold, a gluttonous man and a drunken, a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. He uses the children in the marketplace as an illustration that they're, they're little sinners too and that they would do this. So he would say, hey, I understand that the children are this way, that children have a position. They're little sinners, but there's an issue here bigger than that. So I want to talk to you this morning about the words that are used here and in Luke and in Matthew. Matthew records this, Luke records this, and we, here we have it in Mark. And, Mark. and there's a little bit of differences in each one of them. The word that's used here is a common word, a general term for children in this account of this incident. However, Luke, and I wanted to stop for a second. I wanted to talk about Luke for a second. What is Luke's profession? How many of you know Luke's profession? He's a doctor. But he's not just a doctor, he's also a Gentile. He's not just a doctor, he's not just a Gentile, he's also a historian. How did he come to, to record the things in the Gospel of Luke and in the book of Acts? He interviewed people. He interviewed eyewitnesses to the events and wrote down what they said. So he's very powerful, but the bigger powerful thing that I want to present this morning is that he's a physician. And so the terminology that he's going to use is very important for us to understand, especially with what's just been out there from Joe Scarborough as well. Because did Jesus welcome these little ones? The word that Luke uses here is for, and it refers to specifically to unborn babies. Wait a minute. So the word that Luke uses for this account is unborn babies, newborns or young infants. So that's the lexical range of the word. You just learned something from hermeneutics. We talk about the lexical range of a word. The word that Luke uses in the same exact account is a reference to unborn babies, babies, and young infants. Whoa, wait a minute. In the other account, we just see young children, which is fine. But here, Luke is recording something he got from eyewitnesses to the event to say that these were these little babies, and he chooses a specific word as a doctor to refer to unborn babies. There in the very word to describe this event that Luke uses, we have the understanding of, he's referring to also to unborn babies. Wow. In the womb. Remarkable. I love Luke. I love the fact that he's a Gentile. I love the fact that he's a historian. I love the fact that he's a doctor. He would speak to this day and age dramatically, would he not? He's not a Jewish custom person. He's not a tradition man. He's someone who can speak to the culture of today volumes. And we need to read Luke that way. So that he might touch them. These were the parents who wanted their children to know God, to be a part of his kingdom, and to have eternal life. As any sensible parent, parents in the room, don't you want your children to know the truth of the gospel? Don't you live your life hoping that they will make a profession of Christ as Savior and it will be a genuine hope that they will do that? Sensible parents would do that. They wanted Jesus to pray for their children's spiritual well-being, that God would show favor to them. Is that a good thing? Yeah. If Jesus were here, would you take your kids to him? Your babies, and I want him to bless them. Yes, that's the setting, and Jesus is doing that. He's not shy pushing them away. He's saying, yes, bring them to me. He wants to bless them. But the disciples rebuked them. Wow. The disciples rebuked them. So the word rebuked here is epitomeo, which it means to censor, to reprimand, and is related to a translated word in 2 Corinthians 2 6, which means to punish. Wow. The disciples were following in line with the very thing that Jesus is trying to pull them out of. They're falling in line with tradition. They're falling in line with the teachings of the Pharisees. Like, no, don't let these little kids come to him. This is a bothersome thing. Don't let these little babies come over to Jesus. 
Mark used the word to describe Jesus' rebuke of demons in Mark 1, 25, 3, 12, and 9, 25. A storm, when Jesus rebuked the storm in Mark 4, 30, 39, his warning to the disciples not to reveal who he was as the Messiah in 8.30, Peter's rebuke of Jesus in 8.32, and the Lord's subsequent rebuke of Peter in 8.33, and the crowd's rebuke of a blind man who kept calling out to Jesus in 10.48. Well, we'll get to Bartimaeus soon. That's the strength of the word. That's how adamant they are that these parents not bring these little babies, these little infants, to Jesus. Severe rebuking of them. They're rebuking them. They were little more than an unnecessary interruption to Jesus, and they wanted them not to come. What a thing. In the first verse, we see this. We see the setting, and we see the severity of this rebuke. But what do we see from Jesus? Jesus gets angry. The comparison of this word indignant here is anger. Jesus was angry with his disciples to the point that it's compared to when he went in the temples and he cleansed the temples, the two cleansing of the temples. Look at verse 14. It says, but when Jesus saw this, he was indignant, angry. He was upset and said to them, and it wasn't a sinful, it was not a sinful anger. This was a righteous anger. Permit the children to come to me and don't hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Wow. It's gonna take a little bit of time to unpack that because the as such as these is very, very specific in some regards to who he's talking about. He doesn't say just these, in which case we'd say, okay, there's just, there's just the kids. But he says, such as these. In Luke's account, it's very predominant too. The words that he's using there, the structure that he's using is pointing to the specific group of little infants, the specific group of unborn babies, these infants who have not yet come to a place to know accountability, to know truth, and to make a profession of Christ. That's who Jesus is looking at. Wow, this is comforting. If you've ever lost a child in birth, if you've ever lost a child through miscarriage, if you've ever lost a child that never came to understand or speak, this should comfort you this morning that Jesus is talking about that group of little ones. They're in the kingdom. They haven't come to a place yet where they know how to accept good and evil. Yeah, they're little sinners. They're born in sin. That's not negated. That's not negated. But God's grace is upon these little group of kids. That's what Jesus is conveying to his disciples. Hey, these little ones, the ones that I'm holding, they're going to inherit the kingdom of God. Wow. They're going to inherit the kingdom of God. But that word hinder there, look at the word do not hinder. Unfortunately, There are some who take that word hinder and they want to transpose that and they want to cross-reference that to the book of Acts. There are three places in the book of Acts where there's this word used. And this word is used to not hinder someone to come to baptism. So where do you think I'm going with this one? This is one of the arguments we have for children being baptized. I have been... been guilty of that. Somebody accused me of of doing a a baptism of a child one time. Guess what I did? I was doing a baby dedication for the parents and I put some oil in the little baby's head. The girl in the, in, the, in, the, in the sound booth back there, my daughter, had that done right here on this stage. She was anointed. She doesn't know about it because she was a little baby. She was anointed with oil. Rick McGinty anointed her with oil. Was that a baby baptism? Did we convey salvation upon that little one? No. That was for me and my wife and the godparents there saying, you better watch over her. You better evangelize her. You better tell her the truth. We're committing this to you to watch over this little one that God has given to you. She hasn't been baptized yet, though, so let's work on that. Give her some pressure, 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 pressure. But they take the word hinder there, and they attribute it to what was in the book of Acts in four places. Um, Philip and the eunuch, Ethiopian eunuch, was one of the places where he says, what hinders me from being baptized right now? And they say, this is all about child baptism. I'm saying, no, this is not a strong argument for pedo baptism but this is a better argument. This is a good place to look for comfort to know that if I've lost a child, that that child who didn't know right and wrong, that child didn't know to accountability yet, is going to be in the arms of our Lord and Savior. And I'm not negating predestination. I'm not negating the Lamb's book of life. I'm saying there's a grace that is there on them. And we're gonna look at the Old Testament to see that. So the disciples over emphasized the rebuke of the parents, promoted an indignant response from Jesus. The verb translated indignant is also strong word meaning angry, irate, or outraged. It describes the reaction of the scribes and the Pharisees to the children in the temple who were hailing Jesus as the Messiah in Matthew 21, 15. They use the same word, to rebuke the children there. 
the reaction of the other 10 disciples to the request of James and John for the chief seats in the kingdom. This will be in Mark 41. When James and John wanted those chief seats, this is the same term used. They got angry at James and John. This is the term that Jesus is, that, that, that is being recorded of Jesus. The reaction of some present when a woman anointed Jesus with an expensive perfume in Mark 14, 4, and the reaction of the synagogue officials when Jesus healed on the Sabbath in Luke 13, 14. The term indicates that Jesus was seriously agitated at the disciples for the way they treated the children. The disciples were the sole target of his rebuke, not the parents, his disciples. They need to learn something. We need to learn something this morning too. Remember, this is our learning phase. Jesus is teaching his disciples. He's teaching us this morning too. So the Lord's response to the disciples was emphatic. Permit the children to come to me. He commanded, do not hinder them. Let them come. Allow them to come to me. The present tense of the verb translated hinder indicates that the disciples were to continue to allow the parents and their children to have access to Christ. It was essential that the children be allowed to come to him because, as he told the disciples, the kingdom of God, underline that please, the kingdom of God, salvation, the kingdom of God, the sphere of salvation, belongs to such as these. Belongs to such as these. And Luke uses the, the Greek word here that means such as these, not just these, indicating that Jesus was referring to all those who are unable to believe savingly because they are not reached the point of personal accountability. This is in Luke 18, verse 16. Babies, before they reach the age when they understand good and evil, which varies from child to child, how many of you had a child who was born and you could tell that they were selfish? Well, they start doing right off the bat. Cry. I need a diaper. I need this. I need that. I need that. But do they have a recognition? Do they have an accountability? So under God's gracious special care, if they die before the time their souls understand this truth, they go to heaven. Once past that point, God will hold them responsible if they fail to repent and believe the gospel. I believe that's what's being taught here. I agree with John MacArthur that that's what's being taught here. I don't think this is about pedo baptism. I think this is about these little ones that have grace conveyed upon them. Does this negate original sin from Romans 5, 12 through 21? No. The, corruption, the corrupt nature is present from conception. David wrote, Behold, I was bo- brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Psalm 51, 5. That should be one we underline. In the culture around us right now, you need to have that underlined in your Bible. You should have that on a card. When Joe Scarborough walks up to you, you should say, Joe, what about this? And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That was Jesus. All the red letter in the Old Testament is about him. He spoke these. These are, his, these are his words. All of Scripture, all of Scripture is inspired of God. All of it, not just the red letters. Psalm 58.3 confirms the reality that the wicked are estranged from the womb. These who speak lies go astray from birth. Quote, God said in Genesis 8, 21, the intent of a man's heart is evil from his youth. Cross-reference that with Isaiah 48, 8. Proverbs twenty two fifteen 15 notes that, quote, foolishness is bound up in the heart of the child, end quote. So what do you do about that, parents? You beat it out of them, sorry. <laughs> kind of played my cards too quick there on that one, right? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's a good thing. You discipline them out of love, not out of anger. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is what? Eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. What are our wages? The wages of sin is death. So babies, young children, are in God's kingdom solely by the act of his grace. When he has that little child in his hands, can that little child respond to the gospel? No. But he says, this little one right here is in the kingdom of God. This little one here is in the kingdom of God. What is he pronouncing here? He's saying it's only by Gary alone. It's only by God alone doing it. So everybody's going to leave here and just go do whatever they want today? No. You live accordingly to the grace of God, right? God gave us his grace. We live according to the grace. We say, thank you. Thank you. That temporary condition of grace will become eternal for those who die before becoming accountable. Where do we find this? Where is this? Pastor, you're making a lot of claims this morning, aren't I? Am I making a lot of claims this morning? Am I saying things you're kind of like, hey, I don't know, I think you've made a few claims. Okay, 
I take up that challenge. Let's turn, turn with me back to Deuteronomy chapter 1. Let's find out where this is spoken. Because John Calvin, Charles Hodge, and B.B. Warfield, they realized these things in their studies too. That this was the position of the infant. This is the position of the one in the womb. This is the position of the young infants in our midst to this very day. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 39. Let's, read, let's start in verse 34 down to 39. Let's read this in the context of Deuteronomy being the recount of the law to the people, and he's recounting the history of after the Exodus. So start with me in verse 34 of Deuteronomy chapter 1, where we read this. 39 will be the key for us. Then the Lord heard the sound of your words, and he was angry and took an oath, saying, Not one of these men... This evil generation shall see the good land which I swore to give your fathers. Except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, Nephune, he shall see it. And to him and to his sons I will give the land on which he has set foot. Because he has followed the Lord fully. The Lord was angry with me also and on your account, saying, Not even you shall enter there. Joshua, the son of Nun, who stands before you, he shall enter there. Encourage him, for he will cause Israel to inherit it. Moreover, here it is, verse 39. Moreover, your little ones, infants, little babies, the little ones who haven't come to a point of accountability yet, who you said would become a prey uh, and your sons, who this day have no knowledge of good or evil, shall enter there, and I will give it to them, and they shall possess it. Whoa, there it is right there. The rebellious were going to suffer. The rebellious who came out of the Exodus were going to suffer and not go into the land. But those who were not accountable yet, those who not understood yet what had transpired, were going to go in and receive the blessing of the promised land. We're going to receive from the Lord those things which were to be given to God's people. Jonah 4.11, we read this. Who did not know the difference between their right and their left hand? You're referring to infants. Jeremiah 19, 4 and 5, where God referred to children sacrificed to Baal as innocent. And in Ezekiel 16, 21, where he called children my children, children who were sacrificed to Baal, children who were sacrificed to Moloch, those who did not know what was even going on were saved. R.A. Webb wrote this, if a dead infant were sent to hell on no other account than that of original sin, there would be a good reason to the divine mind for the judgment because sin is a reality. But the child's mind would be a perfect blank as to the reason of its suffering. Under such circumstances, it would know suffering, but it would have no understanding of the reason for its suffering. It could not tell itself why it was awfully smitten and consequently the whole meaning and significance of its sufferings being to it a conscience enigma, a a bewilderment. The very essence of the penalty would be absent and justice would be disappointed, cheated, or or cheated of its vindication. This was R.A. Webb understanding that this is not God's intent at all. Job will also speak of this. Job in Job 3, 11 through 17 will speak of him, why was he even born? Read the story of Job there. But what is the classic text? Turn with me to 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 12. This is the one that Dr. Mike Cannon presented to us in class when he presented his position that he believed this as well. And Dr. Mike Cannon was the one who taught me the skill and science of how to do biblical interpretation. And this was the text, the key text that he turned to in this regard to answer this question. What happens to the unborn? What happens to those who are born and yet do not know how to even speak or have any understanding of right and wrong or can articulate it? Look with me at 2 Samuel chapter 12, starting in verse 13. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And if you remember the story of David, David had committed what? Adultery. With Bathsheba, there was a child that came from that. And to cover this all up, he had her husband killed. And Nathan comes to him. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has taken away your sin. You shall not die. He's merciful to David, but there's still a consequence. He's merciful to David. We talked about this last week in the fact about divorce and that there was mercy given to David. He wasn't stoned to death. Neither was Bathsheba stoned to death. God shows mercy in that. 
But can you continue on in verse 14 where he says there's still a consequence. However, because by this deed you have given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born to you shall surely die. So Nathan went to his house. Then the Lord struck the child that Uriah's widow bore to David, that's Bathsheba, so that he was very sick. David therefore inquired of God for the child, and David fasted and went and lay all night on the ground. The elders of the household stood beside him in order to raise him up from the ground, but he was unwilling and would not eat food with them. Then it happened on the seventh day that the child died, and the servants of God, I'm sorry, the servants of David were afraid to tell him that he, the child was dead. For they said, Behold, while the child was still live, alive, he spoke to him. We spoke to him, sorry, we spoke to him, and he did not listen to our voice. How then can we tell him that the child is dead, since he might do himself harm? But when David saw that his servants were whispering together, David perceived that the child was dead. So David said to his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. So David rose from the ground, washed, anointed himself, and changed his clothes. And he came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Look at that. He now acknowledges and worships God, even after the death of his son. Then he came to his own house. And when he requested, they set food before him, and he ate. They, oh, sorry, then his servants said to him, What is this thing that you have done? While the child was alive, you fasted and wept. But when he died, when the child died, you arose and ate food. He said, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who knows, the Lord may be gracious to me, that the child may live. But now he has died. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? And this is the comforting thing for David when he makes this remark. He's comforted by this. At the end of 23, verse 23, he says this. I will go to him, but he will not return to me. David is not referring to the grave. David is returning, referring to the kingdom of God in heaven. Some say, oh, he's just referring to the grave. What comfort is that? He's comforted knowing that this child is in the arms of God in heaven. And he's saying, this too will be the case for anyone born and yet does not know the speaking of the gospel yet. So, this is a key verse here. Can I bring him back again? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. The salvation of infants who die has been the church's teaching for centuries. The great reformers, Calvin, Charles Hodge, made eloquent recitations of this very teaching in their theologies. What about the salvation analogy? Let's look at the last verse. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will enter into it at all. Now, if you take that and you flip it over the other verse, you say, that's what he's referring to. He's just referring to the characteristics of these children, but that's not the case. He's referring to such as these. He's referring to that group of children in verse 14. In verse 15, he's now saying, these are the characteristics that you hold to. So there's a transition there to another thing. The salvation of young children is an apt analogy that demonstrates that salvation is entirely by grace. It is a death blow to any form of the legalism such as since such children obviously can do nothing to merit salvation, what was the Pharisees teaching? You had to do good works. Jesus is telling these, the, 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 his disciples that is not the case. You can't do enough good works to enter into heaven. Do you guys do good works? Are you God's cre creation, created in him, to do the good works which he prepared what? Beforehand that you would walk in them. Isn't that a comforting thing? God has things for you to do that bring him glory as you acknowledge him. That's Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter at all was a severe rebuke of the legalism, works righteousness system of the Pharisees and their followers and by extension of all who trust in their good works to save them. Anybody trusted in your good works this morning to save you? Wait, I, I came to church. Do I get credit for that? I will sign your card. You get credit for coming to church today. Everybody's good, right? Check. Did you read your Bible this week? Check. You do those things because you enjoy them. Do you guys enjoy being here on Sunday? Who enjoys being on church? Okay, in the back row, I've got a couple of people. She's yawning, it's okay. 
You guys enjoy being here and being in the fellowship of other brothers and sisters in Christ who are like-minded, who know the gospel, who see things through this vision and not Joe Scarborough's? I'm sorry I keep bringing him up, but that I, I got pretty mad two days ago that somebody could put words in my Savior's mouth. He put words in Jesus' mouth. I'm like, I've only got you guys to listen to me. He's got millions. Wow. Can't let that go. Sorry, just can't let that go. No, 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 no. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter at all. Joe, have you truly showed your dependence upon our Lord? Drawing the passage to a close in verse 16, notes that Jesus took the children in his arms and began to bless them. He began to bless them. Turn with me back there to that section. Look at verse 16. And he took them in his arms and began blessing them, laying his hands on them. In Luke, the understanding there is he caressed them, he cuddled them, he brought them in. How do you hold a, how do you hold a baby? Do you hold a baby like you hold, hold your, like this? Like I hold my, my grandson and my granddaughter like this, right? Just kind of grab them with one arm, pull them like this. How do you hold a baby? You don't do the same thing with a baby, do you? The terminology here is like this. He brought them in. He held them dearly and closely to them and then he blessed them. He laid his hands on them and he blessed them. That's the ones he's talking about. These little ones. The Lord's acceptance uh, acceptance pictures the reality that that salvation is by grace alone. The salvation of a child who dies without having performed any meritorious work is the greatest illustration of the foundational biblical truth. It's by faith alone, by grace alone, and Christ alone. Are you guys okay with that? It's by grace alone. Do you proclaim that? Do you believe that when you wake up? Only by God's grace alone do I stand in Christ. You're in Christ. You're in Christ. You have the power that God used to raise him from the dead. Is that a a tremendous thing to think about that? God's put the power inside of you that he used to raise his son from the dead. That's what Paul makes that point in Ephesians. But let's end with that. Let's Let's end with God's grace in Ephesians. Turn with me to Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. You guys all have that memorized? You're like, oh, wait, don't, don't, don't. This is not True 78 right now, but those guys are great. I love the kids at True 78. Let me read to you Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not that of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Who's in control of all of that? God. God is in control of that. And when you acknowledge that, he receives the glory. Do we want to be those who glorify God? Absolutely. This should be the focus of our understanding of our salvation. We're in Christ because he did it. And now I have to walk in in a worthy manner of that. Their children's salvation, these, people's, these people who brought their, their children to Jesus, salvation is a sovereign work of God, but parents are the agents by which that divine work is accomplished. They are the primary missionaries in the lives of their children. Are you the primary mission? Now, if you don't have kids, what about that? True 78 on Wednesday nights. Come and have some fun with the kids. Convey truth to the little ones. Anybody want to come? You can do that. Parents, you are the chief missionaries to your children. You're the ones that are going to tell them the truth of who Christ is. Is that an amazing thing? Missionaries right here? Anyone who doesn't have kids, like I said, come to True 78. I had an opportunity for a plug there. I wasn't going to miss it. By God's grace alone, by God's grace alone, we are saved. Those precious ones that die before birth, and I'm not trying to give fuel to any of that at all. What I'm saying is this. They rest in the arms of Jesus. They rest in the arms of our Savior. Let's pray. Father, may we take this teaching this morning. May we digest it. May we think about it. And may we study it further. Father, to see the truth of what Jesus is teaching about grace alone. And it's only through faith alone. A faith which you have to give us. We don't have that faith. You've got to give it to us. So we're thankful today, Father, to acknowledge that. To glory in that to praise you in that. Thank you for the teaching, Lord. Thank you for the care of Jesus for these little ones. Thank you for the sensitive care of these little children. The kingdom of God belongs to such as these. What a thing for us to fathom this day, Father. To be comforted by it and to be excited about it too. 
Father, I pray that you would work in and through your people, Father, for the furtherance of the gospel, for the, the work that is here at Boone and Sea Street, Lord, to proclaim the truths of Christ, to be salt and light. Father, bless your people and use them for that great ends. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.